Hi, this is Dave Stotts from Drive Through History. Happy St. Patrick's Day. The date of St. Patrick's death, March 17th, is celebrated throughout the world as St. Patrick's Day. In America, it's a day to wear green, march in parades, visit pubs, and eat corned beef and cabbage. Indeed, for Irish Americans, it's a day of ethnic pride. But similar to other special days on the calendar, March 17th has lost much of its original foundation, much of its special meaning. So, what is the forgotten history related to St. Patrick? In this special episode of Drive Through History, we're going to ancient Hibernia, the land of winter, to find out. Patrick was born in Roman-controlled Britain in about 390 AD. When he was a boy, the Roman legions guarding much of Britain had to be withdrawn to defend Rome against invading tribes from Central Asia. After the Roman soldiers were gone, raiders from across the Irish Sea attacked British coastal regions and carried away thousands to sell into slavery. Patrick was probably 16 years old when his village was attacked. He was taken captive here to the rugged shores of Northern Ireland, and he was sold as a slave shepherd to a local Druid chieftain. At the time, Ireland was a vicious land known as Hibernia, the land of winter. Druids controlled the island. It was a barbaric culture that practiced a variety of atrocities, including human sacrifice. Historian Thomas Cahill wrote, Romans in their first encounters with these exposed, insane warriors were shocked and frightened. They were howling and, it seemed, possessed by demons. So outrageous was their strength, featuring all the terrors of hell itself. Thomas Cahill, How the Irish Saved Civilization. To tell the incredible story of Patrick, I will be traveling nearly 800 miles of ancient Irish landscape. For this mission, I got myself the rugged and reliable Range Rover Defender. This is a 2002 Land Rover Defender 110. It's one in a long line of legendary off-road vehicles by the British auto manufacturer. This is a rather unique crew cab edition of the Defender. Basically gives you four by four style seating up here with a pickup style area back here. I can only imagine what this thing has hauled around over the years. My first trek from here on the North Irish coast is to Patrick's first home, Slemish Mountain. This is Slemish Mountain in County Antrim in Northern Ireland. Slemish Mountain, or Sleeve Mish, has long been regarded as the location where Patrick was held captive as a slave shepherd. Slemish Mountain is the plug of an extinct volcano made from mineral-rich dolerite. It has a very distinctive appearance with a steep and rugged top section and smooth sloping fields surrounding the bottom. The mountain dominates the landscape for miles around. Although usually beautiful and full of wildlife this time of year, Slemish Mountain endures months of wet, cold, and nasty weather. On St. Patrick's Day, large crowds hike to the top of Slemish Mountain as a pilgrimage of sorts. 
I hear you can even see Scotland from the summit. I have a feeling that's probably not the case today. Let's do this. The work of a slave shepherd was bitterly isolated and strictly enforced. The Druid slave masters were known for their obsession with fear and death. Human heads were impaled on walls and posts as warnings throughout the whole territory. The local Druid priests also demanded human sacrifices to their many gods. Patrick likely observed the ritual of the Wicker Man, where villagers were forced inside a huge human figure woven of sticks. At the end of the ceremony, the Wicker Man was lit on fire, creating a massive blaze that could be seen for miles. This is the awful world that Patrick experienced while fighting off packs of wolves and wild boars on the slopes of Slumish. He later wrote in his autobiography, Confession, I did not believe in the living God, nor did I from my childhood, but lived in death and unbelief until I was severely chastised by hunger and nakedness. As Patrick faced his first months of loneliness, hunger, illness, and despair here on Slumish Mountain, he began seeking God. But after I came to Ireland, every day I had to tend sheep, and many times a day I prayed, the love of God and his fear came to me more and more, and my faith was strengthened. And my spirit was moved so that in a single day I would say as many as a hundred prayers, and almost as many in the night. And this even when I was staying in the woods and on the mountains, and I used to get up for prayer before daylight, through snow, through frost, through rain. There the Lord opened the sense of my unbelief that I might at last remember my sins and be converted with all my heart to the Lord my God, who comforted me as would a father his son. St. Patrick Confession. Well, I made it to the summit of Slemish Mountain. To think that Patrick ended up serving six long years as a slave shepherd up in these harsh, secluded hills of Northern Ireland. Although beautiful, I can't imagine the painful isolation, alone, with no social contact, no community. Looking out at this stunning landscape, Patrick's story reminds me of another historic figure that served as a shepherd in seclusion during his young life. David, from the Old Testament. Scripture tells us that David spent his formative years developing his courage and character alone in the Judean wilderness. While tending sheep, both of these men developed a total dependence on God. In Psalm 63, when David was alone in the desert of Judah, he wrote, you, God, are my God, earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you, my whole being longs for you, in a dry and parched land where there is no water. On my bed I remember you, I think of you through the watches of the night, because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings, I cling to you, your right hand upholds me. After six tough years in this area of Northern Ireland, totally relying upon God, Patrick wrote that he had a life-changing dream. In confession, he recalled, One night I heard in my sleep a voice saying to me, It is well that you fast. Soon you will go to your own country. And again, a voice saying to me, See, your ship is ready. And it was not near, but at a distance of perhaps 200 miles. Then I took to flight. I went in the strength of God, who directed my way, until I came to that ship.
Almost immediately, Patrick snubbed his fear of punishment, left his flocks, and walked many days to a foretold location on the Irish coast. He was about 22 years old. Now, tradition tells us that Patrick caught a ship somewhere between here at Hothhead near Dublin and Wicklow Head, about 45 miles south of me. Now, geographically, this is the easternmost region on the mainland of the Republic of Ireland. Patrick the Fugitive traveled back over the Irish Sea to Britain. There, he joined a monastery and dedicated the next 20 years of his life to pursuing God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Much of what we know about Patrick comes from his own account, confession. It's rather short, about 6,600 words in the English translation, but it's filled with incredible personal insights. Eight Latin manuscripts survive, the earliest being from the 9th century. Another primary source is The Life of St. Patrick, written by Muirchu in about 680 AD. According to Muirchu and other traditions, Patrick spent the next 20 years of his life in Britain and France, studying at places such as St. Martin's Monastery in Tours and the island refuge of Laren's Abbey. He ultimately became a priest, probably ordained in Auxerre, France. After two decades, Patrick couldn't deny his heart for the Irish people and his calling to return to them. According to confession, he had a series of dreams and visions that finally compelled him to return to Ireland. It was about 432 AD. At this point in history, Ireland was dominated by full-scale barbarism, where murder, rape, slavery, and human sacrifice were commonplace. Nonetheless, Patrick wrote, I am ready to be murdered, betrayed, enslaved, whatever come my way. He had to return for the Irish people he loved. So let's return to Ireland and see what happened next. According to one tradition, Patrick returned to Ireland through the Straits of Strangford Lock in about 432 AD. Strangford Lock is a large sea inlet on the east coast of Northern Ireland. In fact, it's the largest inlet in all the British Isles, covering nearly 60 square miles. Strangford Lock is almost totally enclosed by the Ards Peninsula and is linked to the Irish Sea by a long, narrow channel. The main inlet is an incredible site with at least 70 islands and a number of outcroppings, bays, and coves. Tradition tells us that Patrick sailed into Strangford Lock landing at the mouth of a small river known as the Slaney. Today, this spot is accessible via a road appropriately marked as St. Patrick's Trail. Here, Patrick is said to have met a local chieftain named Daiku, who became his first convert to Christianity. Daiku gave Patrick a barn about two miles up the road that became Patrick's first church. The word for barn in Irish was saval, from which we get the anglicized word Saul. Today, this village is known as Saul in honor of Patrick's first barn church here in Ireland. One of the oldest establishments in Saul is Paddy's Barn, a family-run restaurant, pub, and bed and breakfast. It's lunchtime, so uh, history's gonna have to wait. I would say Patty's Barn knows how to set a table. This is a meal, my friends. 
fit for a hungry Irishman. All right, so I ordered the uh, roast of the day, turkey, ham, and stuffing with potatoes, and a side of sausage and mash. Uh, and this is just mash. Well, French fries? I mean, uh, that'd be chips. How many ways can you serve a potato? By my count, I've got five. Uh, we have roasted, we have fried chips, baby new boiled, Ow. mashed and mashed with onion gravy. And in case my kids are watching, my broccoli. Mm. Ah, that was good. Excuse me, sir, you've got a little something. That hill above the village of Saul is considered the spot where Patrick's barn church first stood. Many consider this site the cradle of Christianity for Ireland. Following Patrick's death, there was a Christian monastery up there for more than 300 years until it was plundered and burned by the Vikings. A medieval abbey replaced the monastery, but that too was later pillaged and burned to the ground. The Church of Ireland built a new church up there in 1932 to commemorate the 1500th anniversary of Patrick's return to Ireland. It is known as St. Patrick's Memorial Church. Let's go take a look. This is St. Patrick's Memorial Church, or simply Saul Church. The church's design matches its early heritage. Its interior is barn-like, with rough granite walls and a dark wooden roof. The graveyard contains this tiny church-shaped building called a mortuary house. This was for revered burials and probably dates to the 11th or 12th century. Now, the founders of Ireland's early churches were often proclaimed as saints and their bones exhumed and placed in these mortuary houses. A few archaeologists believe that this mortuary house was originally created for the bones of St. Patrick, but we just don't know for sure. This spire-looking structure is a replica of an ancient tower design found throughout Ireland. The Irish Round Tower, as it's come to be known, is a stone silo structure unique to Ireland. They were originally built as bell towers, but they were also used as storage facilities and lookouts. Typically found near a church or a monastery, the door of the tower usually faced the west doorway of the church. Therefore, archaeologists have used round towers to locate the underground remains of lost churches all over Ireland. I think they're expecting me, so. <clears throat> I thought we called ahead. Surviving towers range in height from about 60 to 130 feet. The lower portion had a single door raised six to nine feet off the ground, only accessible by a ladder. This was more for structural integrity than defense, since the towers were generally built with very little foundation. Many had two to three wooden doors inside with ladders in between. Slits near the top acted as defensible windows. Scholars estimate that about 120 round towers were built in Ireland between the 9th and 12th centuries. Many still exist in various states of ruin, but 18 to 20 are almost fully intact. Near St. Patrick's Memorial Church in Saul is Sleeve Patrick or Patrick Mountain. It's a great little hike to the summit where there's an incredible view of Strangford Lock in the surrounding countryside. I 
At the top of Sleeve Patrick, there is also this massive statue of St. Patrick with these bronze panels showing scenes from his life. In 1932, on the 1500th anniversary of Patrick landing in this area, the owner of this property donated it to the Catholic Church. As part of the 1500th anniversary celebration, construction began on this Austin Memorial statue. Oh, and here's that amazing view of Strangford Lock I was talking about earlier. Almost looks real, doesn't it? You know, it's no wonder that Patrick used the three-leaf clover, which are covering this entire hillside, as a, a way to teach the concept of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's a truly gifted teacher. This is the Hill of Slain in County Mead. This site has been connected to Patrick for centuries. Now the tradition of this place goes back to 433 AD when Patrick lit a Paschal fire here in defiance of the local pagan king. Paschal comes from the Hebrew word Pesach, meaning Passover. Now the Paschal fire celebrates the Passover mystery of salvation through Jesus Christ and it is lit in many churches just before Easter. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, Patrick challenged royal authority by lighting the Paschal fire on the hill slain on the night of Easter Eve. It chanced to be the occasion of a pagan festival at Terra, during which no fire may be kindled until the royal fire had been lit. The hill of Terra is over there, about 10 miles away. It was a significant pagan worship site going back millennia. It contains a number of ancient monuments and according to tradition, was the seat of the High King of Ireland. Throughout Ireland, we see evidence of ancient pagan cultures. Usually the evidence is in the form of a human-made stack of stones called a cairn. Cairns have been used all over the ancient world for all sorts of purposes from burial monuments, defensive structures, religious ceremonies, or to mark hunting grounds, or even to map the planets in stars. On the Hill of Terra, you can see remains of different types of pagan cairns, from this monolithic marker on top to this more elaborate and mysterious Mound of the Hostages, which contains a series of burial and storage chambers. A large fire here at the Hill of Slain, or over on the Hill of Terra, which you can see on the horizon behind me, would be visible to the other, especially in the dark of night. Here's how Murchu, a writer from the late 600s, described Patrick's challenge to the Druids at Terra that evening. The custom was that whoever lit a fire before the king on that one night of the year, Easter's Eve, would be put to death. Patrick lit the Paschal fire before the king on the Hill of Slain. The people saw Patrick's fire throughout the plain, and the king ordered a number of chariots to go and seize Patrick. The king exclaimed, if we do not extinguish this flame, it will sweep over all Ireland. Seeing that the heathen were about to attack him, Patrick rose and said clearly and loudly, may God come up to scatter his enemies, and may those who hate him flee from his face. By Patrick's curse in the king's presence, seven times seven men fell, and the king, driven by fear, came and bent his knees before the holy man. Many have called this Patrick's Elijah-type encounter with the pagan leaders here in this region. Patrick, who had stoked his fire in honor of Christ's resurrection, so impressed the local population that the High King ordered the protection of Patrick 
and his new religion in this area. The Hill of Slain has been marked as a Christian site ever since. Over the centuries, it has even been considered a center of Christian learning. These are the ruins of a friary church and college that were last restored in 1512. The friary was ultimately abandoned in 1723 and has since fallen into disrepair. The ruins include this 62-foot Gothic-style tower. What an incredible archaeological site. So, Patrick had an early victory for the gospel here at the Hill of Slain. With the support of the local king, this event gave Patrick momentum in this region of Ireland. However, as Patrick expanded his preaching, there are accounts of Druid kings in other regions trying to ambush and kill Patrick nearly a dozen times. In confession, Patrick wrote, Daily I expect murder, fraud, or captivity, but I fear none of these things because of the promises of heaven. The merciful God often freed me from slavery and from twelve dangers in which my life was at stake, not to mention numerous plots. God is my witness, who knows all things even before they come to pass, as he used to forewarn even me of many things by a divine message. I came to the people of Ireland to preach the gospel and to suffer insults from the unbelievers. I am prepared to give even my life without hesitation and most gladly for his name, and it is there that I wish to spend it until I die. Tradition tells us that it was at the Hill of Slain where Patrick first used a shamrock, a three-leafed clover, to explain the Holy Trinity to the Druid culture. In pagan Ireland, three was a mystical number. The Druids also had a number of triple deities where three different gods were worshipped together in a triad. It is said that Patrick capitalized on widespread cultural myths to teach the triune nature of the Christian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Ultimately, the pagan culture started referring to the God of the Bible as the God of the Three Faces. In church arts, Patrick is often depicted holding a shamrock in one hand. The shamrock has also been considered a symbol for St. Patrick's Day in the church for centuries. However, in American culture, the shamrock has lost its connection with Patrick's teaching of the triune nature of God. In fact, the shamrock is now more of a good luck charm associated with the luck of the Irish, especially the rare four-leaf version. While Patrick maintains his position as the patron saint of Ireland, the shamrock also maintains its status as the national emblem of Ireland, even to this day. So, let's return to Ireland for the next stop in our journey through the life of St. Patrick. This is Westport in the county of Mayo on the extreme western side of Ireland. I'm in a stunning U-shaped valley created by an ancient glacier flowing into Clue Bay. Now in 441 AD, tradition holds that Patrick spent 40 days on the summit of that mountain up there, praying, fasting, and seeking God. Let's drive a few miles for a closer look. This is Crow Patrick, meaning Patrick's Stack, known locally as the Reek. The mountain is one of the highest peaks in Western Ireland at 2,507 feet, overlooking Clue Bay and the countryside of County Mayo. Many consider this the holiest mountain in all of Ireland, with a tradition of pilgrimage going back some 5,000 years. Before Patrick, it was a place for pagan rituals, including a major celebration at the beginning of the harvest season. Since Patrick, it's been a place for pilgrims to honor his 40-day fast and his sold-out dedication 
to Jesus Christ. This is Marisk Abbey at the base of the mountain. It was founded in 1457 as a friary to help instruct the local Catholics in their faith. It is built on a site traditionally connected to a simple church that St. Patrick built. Due to suppression during the Reformation period, the friars were driven out in 1577. All that's left of Marisk Abbey today are ruins of a church with one central aisle and the east wing of the friary buildings. Behind the main altar space, that east window is the finest feature of the ruins. To this day, it still has an incredible view of the Reek. Each year, the Reek attracts about one million visitors. On the last Sunday in July, known as Reek Sunday, over 25,000 pilgrims climb the mountain on that single day alone. Prayer meetings are held on the way up and masses are held in the small chapel at the summit. Some even climb the mountain barefoot as an act of penance. This is the official starting point for the pilgrimage hike, St. Patrick himself. A local priest erected this awesome statue in 1928 with money he raised in America. Now at the summit is St. Patrick's Chapel. There's archeological evidence of a chapel being on that summit since the late fifth century. The current version was built in 1905. I knew I wouldn't have time to make it to the top, but I couldn't help going about halfway just to get a taste of the experience that drives so many pilgrims up this mountain. I also couldn't help thinking about Patrick's legacy, an ordinary man with a life of hardship. Patrick's renown has lived on here for a millennia and a half, inspiring the faith and devotion of millions, all because he was willing to suffer for God. So many followers of Christ, myself included, can be tempted to spend our lives pursuing our own dreams. And yet Patrick's life is a call to something greater. What God can do with a simple person with extraordinary faith is immeasurable. So many places in Ireland would simply be just another hill or mountain, but have enormous historical significance because of Patrick's legacy of faithfulness. The next such place was about a half an hour drive away at an 800-year-old abbey. As I drove away from Crow Patrick, I visited Ballantubber Abbey, an incredible monastery with a long history in County Mayo. Now, among the ruins is this ancient well which is the traditional location for Patrick's baptisms in this region of Ireland. Now it's said this stone alongside the baptismal pool bears the imprint of St. Patrick's knee because he performed so many baptisms here. is the historic city of Armagh in Northern Ireland. Since the time of Patrick, Armagh has been considered an education center known as the city of saints and scholars. After centuries of Christian monasteries, the educational tradition continued with the founding of the Royal School in 1608, the Armagh Observatory in 1790, and St. Patrick's College in 1834. In about 455, Patrick built a stone church here and declared Armagh the central church of Ireland. St. Patrick is considered the first bishop of Armagh and the Church of Ireland has been on this site ever since. Since Patrick, the church itself has been destroyed and rebuilt over a dozen times. The last significant restoration on the current structure was between 1834 and 1840.
In addition to the cathedral, these steep streets going to the city below are rich with history. This is the Armagh Robinson Library, founded in 1771. And this is the city's former infirmary dating to 1774. Even many of these houses near the cathedral still survive from the 1700s. And on the neighboring hill, way over there, you can see another awesome cathedral. Let's go check it out. Patrick established Armagh as his central church in Ireland. Now this incredible Roman Catholic cathedral over on the next hill has been built in various phases between 1840 and 1904. It serves as the seat of the Catholic Archbishop of Armagh, primate of all Ireland. Although there is a tumultuous history between Catholics and Protestants here in Northern Ireland, the two cathedrals dedicated to St. Patrick here in Armagh are currently very cordial to one another. Many consider these two churches on neighboring hillsides as a powerful symbol of Christian reconciliation and unity. There are dozens of churches here in Ireland that bear St. Patrick's name and probably have some sort of connection to an event in his life. We just can't visit them all. However, we would be derelict in our drive through history duties if we didn't take you to the most famous one here in Ireland. The next stop, the capital city of Dublin. This is the famous St. Patrick's Cathedral of Dublin. Since 1869, this has been considered the national cathedral of the Church of Ireland. While history tells us that some sort of church has been on this site since 890 AD, construction on the current building began in 1220. With its 141 foot spire, St. Patrick's Cathedral is the tallest and largest church in Ireland. And the massive interior of St. Patrick's Cathedral is simply stunning. According to tradition, Patrick performed many of his baptisms at a well near here. In the early 1900s, archaeologists discovered a number of stone grave markers from the 10th century at a park next door. One of the stone slabs covered the entrance to an ancient well, and some scholars believe that this was St. Patrick's well, where he performed baptisms. The stone marker is now here at St. Patrick's Cathedral. St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin is a fitting tribute to the huge impact and incredible legacy of St. Patrick here in Ireland. Patrick died on March 17th, 461 AD. Now, we don't know the circumstances surrounding his death, but it appears that it was just old age. Before his death, St. Patrick wrote this. Patrick the sinner, an unlearned man to be sure. None should ever say that it was my ignorance that accomplished any small thing. It was the gift of God. 
We have one more stop in the life of St. Patrick, the place where he's laid to rest. Despite some claims that St. Patrick is buried at Saul, long tradition puts his grave here, beside Down Cathedral, just a few miles away. In the period following St. Patrick's death, the Hill of Down came to be regarded as his burial place. There are references to early monasteries on this site from the 6th century onward. In 1183, Benedictine monks established a monastery here, parts of which are built into the present structure. They left in 1538 and the monastery gradually fell into ruins. Toward the end of the 18th century, a number of notable families in County Down raised funds to restore the building that you see here. Today, Down Cathedral is known as the Cathedral Church of the Holy Trinity. It's an Anglican church that opens its doors to all visitors, honoring the legacy of Patrick. Regarding his legacy, the historian Thomas Cahill wrote, only this former slave had the right instincts to impart to the Irish a new story, one that made sense of all their old stories and brought them a peace they had never known before. Because of Patrick, a barbarian land lay down the swords of battle, flung away the knives of sacrifice, and cast away the chains of slavery. In 1900, this granite boulder was placed here, inscribed with a cross in the name Patrick. Many scholars agree this simple slab is the probable location for Patrick's burial site. Returning to our comparison of St. Patrick to King David, Psalm 78 says, He chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. Psalm 78, 70 through 72. What a powerful picture of St. Patrick's similar legacy here in Ireland. In his 30 years of ministry, St. Patrick is credited with baptizing 120,000 people and founding 300 churches in Ireland. In the following century, Irish missionaries such as Columba sailed back to Britain and Europe where they evangelized the heathen hordes which had overrun the Roman Empire. Irish missionaries also circulated the so-called Code of Patrick in Britain where it laid the foundation for English common law. And maybe most importantly, monks like Columba established a network of monasteries dedicated to Christian learning and the preservation of the handwritten biblical manuscripts. There's one ancient monastery that's been on my bucket list for quite some time. And since I was in Ireland, I decided to go for it. Here's the story of Skellig Michael. Skellig Michael, or Great Skellig, is the larger of the two Skellig Islands, about eight miles from the Irish coast of County Kerry. The name Skellig comes from a Gaelic word meaning rock in the sea. Within 100 years of the death of St. Patrick, a Christian monastery was established here 
as a place of Christian isolation, learning, and protection. The monastery remained in continual use until it was abandoned in the late 12th century. Most of the island and the ruins of the monastery became a UNESCO World Heritage Site back in 1996. The Skellig Islands are also considered important nesting grounds for rare species of birds. And spoiler alert, since 2015, Skellig Michael has doubled as a hideout for a certain Jedi hermit. You know, it's not easy getting to Skellig Michael. Only a few boat operators have permits, and there's only a few month window during the summer when the weather cooperates. Even then, trips to the islands are canceled. The seas are too rough. The monastery is only accessible by three sets of steps, which come right out of the sea. The monks created three routes, known as the east, south, and north steps, so that they could have access during different weather conditions. As you can imagine, this place gets very nasty, even inaccessible during the dark winter months. Today, only these south steps are open to visitors. The south and north steps meet here at Christ's Saddle and continue as one to the monastery. Skellig Michael has two distinct peaks connected by a flat center part behind me known as Christ's Saddle. Each peak is associated with an awesome archaeological site, both of which are a testament to the amazing engineering skills of the monks. The first site is this main monastery built right into the steep slope on the east side of the island. The monastery complex includes a main church, smaller chapels, graveyard, garden, water cisterns, and these famous beehive huts for living quarters. It was an incredible journey to a truly epic location on our planet. Not only are the natural features stunning, but the historical importance of the place is momentous. Skellig Michael represents an awesome era when monks in secluded places helped preserve Christianity and its biblical manuscripts. Historian Kenneth Clark writes, it is hard to believe that for quite a long time, almost a hundred years, Western Christianity survived by clinging to places like Skellig Michael, a pinnacle of rock, miles from the Irish coast, rising 700 feet out of the sea. Now, the hundred years of which he speaks stretch from the late fifth century after Patrick's death to the late sixth century, by which time Irish monks had reconnected barbarized Europe to the texts and traditions of Christianity. Skellig Michael represents an awesome era when monks in secluded places helped preserve Christianity and its biblical manuscripts. After the Roman Empire collapsed and the European continent fell into chaos, the pagan island, once known as Hibernia, stepped up and almost single-handedly preserved the foundations of Western civilization. And speaking of biblical texts from this era, let's return to Dublin one last time and explore one of Ireland's great national treasures. I'm back in Dublin at historic Trinity College to check out one of the most famous biblical texts in the world, the Book of Kells. Trinity College was founded in 1592 by Queen Elizabeth I. It was modeled after the universities of Oxford and Cambridge in Britain. But unlike those other ancient universities, only one college was ever established here. So the designations Trinity College and University of Dublin are interchangeable. Trinity College is widely considered to be the most prestigious university in Ireland and among the most highly regarded in all of Europe. The 
Brook of Kells takes its name from the Abbey of Kells, which was its home for centuries. But today it's here at the old library of Trinity College. The old library was constructed in the 18th century to house Trinity's massive collection. Upstairs is the famous Long Room, which displays 200,000 of the library's oldest books in these incredible oak bookcases. Downstairs is the Book of Kells exhibition, turning darkness into light. The highlight is the room known as the Treasury, where the actual Book of Kells and related manuscripts are on display. To preserve the Book of Kells, the library usually shows two of the four volumes at a time. The curators also rotate through one page of illustration and one page of text, so no page is exposed to the environment for very long. As a sensitive national treasure of Ireland, we can't film it, but I'm going down to take a look without the cameras. The Book of Kells is an illuminated manuscript containing the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. An illuminated manuscript is a handwritten copy of the text, decorated with colorful initials, borders, and illustrations. The Book of Kells was created in Ireland or England in about 800 AD by monks belonging to the Columba movement, which was directly influenced by Patrick. It was written in Latin, drawing from the Vulgate and other earlier texts, and is considered a masterpiece of Western calligraphy and biblical illumination. The Book of Kells is widely regarded as Ireland's finest national treasure. In the 12th century, the historian Gerald of Wales called it, quote, the work of an angel, not of a man. One of the most revered pages of illustration illuminates the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 18. In Latin, the verse begins, this is how Christ came to be born. The illustration page is crafted almost entirely around the name of Christ, or more specifically, the traditional abbreviation using the Chi Rho symbol. Chi and Rho are two letters of the Greek alphabet, the first two letters of Christ. Chi is written as an X, Rho is roughly a P. Remember, this was hand-drawn in about 800 AD. The Greek letters almost appear to float on the page. The Book of Kells is one of the most famous examples of a biblical manuscript produced from the late 6th through the early 9th centuries in monasteries planted as a direct result of Patrick. It also turns out these monasteries were the key to preserving Christian texts after the fall of the Roman Empire and during the darker periods of European history that followed. In fact, when we look back on history, it was the outlying island of Ireland that was central to preserving Western civilization. It was the monasteries that protected Christian traditions, hand copied the biblical manuscripts, maintained other key texts of Western thought, and generally re-evangelized Europe after the fall of Rome. And it all started with the faith, courage, and endurance of a man named Patrick. Let's end this special episode with a powerful prayer attributed to Patrick, the patron saint of Ireland. Happy St. Patrick's Day indeed. May the strength of God guide us. May the power of God preserve us. May the wisdom of God instruct us. May the hand of God protect us. May the way of God direct us. May the shield of God defend us. May the angels of God guard us against the snares of the evil one, against the temptations of the world. May Christ be with us. May Christ be before us. May Christ be in us. Christ be over all. May thy grace, Lord, always be ours, this day, O Lord, and forevermore. Amen.